I guess we'll uh, we'll just start reading this Leibniz uh, document. It was written in seventeen, uh, sorry, sixteen eighty six. Um, I guess I'll just say a couple of quick words about it before we start. Um, the thing that I think people should hold in mind, if, if you've seen Cynthia's class, I think everyone one here saw Cynthia's class from our last science symposium on the Leibniz versus Clark correspondence. Um, if you, for people watching online, if you haven't seen that, I'll put it as a link in the description box of this video. Um, it's a really good uh, presentation, which does get at some essential uh, differences of these two different opposing paradigms that we've been reading about over the course of the, the Venice versus Leibniz essay by uh, that we just finished. Um, <clears throat> of this this car this mechanical view of a universe that is devoid of goodness, uh, truth, and reason, versus uh, the the other idea of a universe governed by um, reason, beauty, goodness that are all different sides of the same the same thing. Uh, great poets are, are always trying to find ways of expressing that in different cultures. And in it, um, the, I think the point that was the most important was the idea of whether God that cre God the force that created the universe is is he a tyrant? Is he a tyrant? modeled in the image of an oligarch who just does things because he has the power to do anything he wants and thus because he does it it is good or is it good and thus he does it is 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 god also reasonable right um and leibniz takes offense with this idea of, of an amoral uh tyrannical creator which is one of the uh, the byproducts of a newtonian system and though people don't realize it that is that is one of the effects which which is developed in various ways in the course of that correspondence and that that happens at the end of Leib of Leibniz's life I think in 1716 um, this paper that we're going to read his essay uh, discourses on metaphysics occurs 25 uh, sorry 40 years even earlier in, in the 1680s and it I think really encapsulates very nicely the core essentials of where Leibniz is coming from. How did he develop his way of thinking? Um, what is his relationship to the ancients, to Plato, um, to the immortality of the soul doctrine? And he's already doing battle with the, at the time, I mean, Newton really wasn't a major force. He was a, an up and coming force in, uh, in the world of geopolitical or ep epistemological warfare. But it was still, it was still Descartes, who was, I think, a little bit more powerful or influential at the time, and Leibniz was in the midst of just destroying the the Cartesian uh, system with his recent discoveries of of uh, the infinitesimal, infinitesimal calculus and uh, and his broader sense of dynamics, which is which is a very different world than the one that that Descartes lived in. So you're going to see him taking aim at, at Descartes in a few different ways. And also, the last thing just before we start reading that I want people to keep in mind is that the, the, the polarization that he's trying to resolve in society is found amongst sort of two schisms, two extremes, where people tend to fall into the traps of either uh, religious dogmatists, whether in the, the aristocracy that he's trying to organize or whether in the masses, uh, that he's also, you know, he's, he's an institution builder. He's building academies. He's trying to always think about how do I create things that are going to transcend individual lifetimes and bring and uplift people. And he's do, that's why he's the, the founder of the Academy of, of Science of Prussia, later on of Russia, um, of France, you know. So he's, he, he's got this, these dichotomies that he's trying to resolve. On the one hand, so you have this religious fundamentalism where a lot of people are, are happy with the quality of logic that's simply, why is something the way it is? Because God made it that way. Like, you know, why are there clouds the way they are? Because God. And you're like, I guess so, kind of, but it's not really mentally very rigorous. Um, and then on the other hand, you have people who become overly logical. We've got the, you know, the new enlightenment age that we were reading about with the Sarpy followers the people who like John Locke or others are trying to make the argument that the mind is really just the sum total of the senses and that science is just the measurement of sense impressions and the creation of models based upon patterns you get in your senses that become, you could say, laws. But that's totally devoid of any type of final cause. That's, that's a lot of contingent cause, a lot of mechanical, like, you know, minor causes, but it doesn't deal with the satisfying higher causes. 
the one only deals like if you just if you're just a, a biblical a biblical fundamentalist you're only kind of oversaturated with final causes because god and if you're if you're on the other you know free thinker extreme you tend to fall into the there is no cause it's just it is because it is like it's just like you know <laughs> uh yeah just a, a world of infinite reductio reductio ad absurdum descriptions that you could always find one mechanical cause before another before another before another with never getting anywhere fun fundamental so he's trying to resolve this and, and you'll see that playing out in the course of the essay um i think that was pretty much the only the main things to have in mind so let's do a, a screen share and like last time um it's broken up into sections so we'll just take turns reading uh section after section i guess each person can do maybe two sections unless one is particularly short. Um, yeah, and there's 37 sections, so it's a bit long. There's probably better translations out there. This is the only translation I've read. So, and I, I like the attitude of the translator. He's got sort of like a bit of a, a bit of personal attitude that I, I kind of like, but I don't know if it's the best that's, that's out there. So we'll try it. Um, who wants to read the first section? Okay, hang on. I'll do it. Please. Uh, the most widely accepted and sharpest notion of God that we have can be expressed like this. God is an absolutely perfect being. But though this is widely accepted, its consequences haven't been well enough thought out. As a start on exploring them, let us note that there are various completely different ways of being perfect and that God has them all, each in the highest degree. We also need to understand what a perfection is. Here is one pretty good indicator. A property is not a perfection unless there is a highest degree of it. So number and shape are not perfections because there cannot possibly be a largest number or a largest thing of a given shape. That is, a largest triangle or square or the like. But there is nothing impossible about the greatest knowledge or about omnipotence. Here equals greatest possible power. So power and knowledge are perfections, and God has them in unlimited form. It follows that the actions of God, who is supremely, indeed infinitely, wise, are completely perfect. This is not just metaphysical perfection, but also the moral kind. His moral perfection, so far as it concerns us, amounts to this. The more we come to know and understand God's works, the more inclined we shall be to find them excellent and to give us everything we could have wished. Some people, including Descartes, hold that there are no rules of goodness and perfection in the nature of things or in God's ideas of them, and that in calling the things God made good, all we mean is that God made them. I am far from agreeing with this. If it were right, then God would not have needed after the creation to see that they were good. As Holy Scripture says, he did because he already knew that the things in question were his work. In saying this, and God saw everything that he had made and uh, or the, uh, there, I, something is blocked here on my screen on the right. Oh, is it better now? Can I? Uh, the, uh, I can't read the whole thing unless you can move it over to the, to uh, the left side of the screen because the, the pictures are blocking it. Oh, you can move the pictures. Well, the, the people, us. You can move the people. So you can take your little mouse over the people yeah. at the okay. top. <laughs> I'm not used to this. Either. Oh, I just eradicated you guys. All That's right. Fine. We can still see okay. it. 
saw everything that he made. And behold, it was very good. Scripture treats God as like man, but its purpose in doing this appears to be to get across the point that a thing's excellence can be seen by looking just at the thing itself without reference to the entirely external fact about what caused it. Reinforcing that point is this one. The works must bear the imprint of the workman because we can learn who he was just by inspecting them. I have to say that the contrary opinion strikes me as very dangerous. And as coming close to the view of the Spinozists that the beauty of the universe and the goodness we attribute to God's works are merely the illusions of people who conceive God as being like themselves. Furthermore, if you say, as Descartes did, that things are good not because they match up to objective standards of goodness, but only because God chose them, you will unthinkingly destroy all God's love and all his glory. For why praise him for what he has done? if he would be equally praiseworthy for doing just the opposite. Where will his justice and wisdom be? If there is only a kind of despotic power, if reason's place is taken by will, and if justice is tyrannically defined as what best pleases the most powerful. Leibniz here relies on his view that it is through reason that we learn what things are good. Oh, yeah. Those are little uh, commentators, uh, translate the translator's commentaries. Okay. Yeah. And, and another point, it seems that any act of the will presupposes some reason for it. A reason that naturally precedes the act. So that God's choices must come from his reasons for them, which involve his knowledge of what would be good. So they can't be the sources of the goodness of things. That is why I find it weird when Descartes says that the eternal truths of metaphysics and geometry, and therefore also the rules of goodness and justice and perfection are brought about by God's will. Against this, they seem to me to be the results of his understanding and no more to depend on his will than his intrinsic nature does. Mm. Mm. Any, yeah, that, there's a lot there. Um, does anybody have any thought or, or question after having just read that or do we want to just let that simmer in and keep reading? Well, I'm not sure when he's saying that his will, we're, we're talking, uh, he's talking about Descartes there, you know, right? Yeah. And, uh, Descartes is sort of uh, talking about, you know, like things being God's will. And uh, I'm getting the impression that, you know, uh, Leibniz is saying that, you know, there's more behind it. There's something, uh, uh, something that God is uh, something more, uh, metaphysical in, in, in God's intention. Yeah, I'm getting that same sense. I, I, I mean, like he said, he, he thinks that it's, it's, it's not satisfying in, in Leibniz's mind to say with, with Descartes that uh, the laws of geometry are good because God made them good, or they're, but rather they're good because God, of God's understanding, not just his arbitrarily, like not just his arbitrary choices, but they're reasonable and they're, they're reasonable and that's primary to anything else. It's not like just because, um, yeah, like we, we, we can't accept it just because we say that God did it. You know, it, there's got to be uh, something good behind it. No? Yeah, and God wouldn't have wanted to do it. Had it not been, if it didn't already possess the property of being reasonable and good, um, if, so I think that he's always 
trying to get that condition into it, into the, the decision-making process of judgment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. I want you to read a couple more They're They're not as big as I, I remembered they were. So, yeah. Okay. Nor could I ever accept the view of some recent philosophers who have the nerve to maintain that God's creation is not utterly perfect and that he could have acted much better. This opinion, it seems to me, has consequences that are completely contrary to the glory of God, just as a lesser evil contains an element of good. So a lesser good contains an element of evil. The act with fewer perfections than one could have done is to act imperfectly, uh, showing an architect that we could have done his work better, th that he could have done his work better in finding fault with it. Furthermore, this opinion goes against Holy Scripture's assurance of the goodness of God's work. That goodness can't consist simply in the fact that the works have been worse, and here is why. Whatever God's work was like, it would always have been good in comparison with some possibilities, because there is no limit to how bad things could be. But being praiseworthy in this way is hardly being praiseworthy at all. I believe one could find countless passages in the Holy Scriptures and writings of the Holy Fathers that support my opinion and hardly any to support the modern view to which I have referred, a view that I think was never heard of in ancient times. It has arisen merely because we are not well enough acquainted with the general harmony of the universe and the hidden reasons of, for God's conduct. And that makes us recklessly judge that many things could have been improved. Furthermore, these moderns argue subtly, but not soundly, from the false premise that however perfect a thing is, there is always something still more perfect. They also think that their view provides for God's freedom through the idea that if God is free, it must be up to him whether he acts perfectly or not. But really, it is the highest freedom to act perfectly in accordance with sovereign reason. For the view that God sometimes does something without having any reason for his choice, <coughs> besides seeming to be impossible, is hardly compatible with this glory. Suppose that God, facing a choice between A and B, opts for A, without having any reason for preferring it to B. I see nothing to praise on that, because all praise should be grounded in some reason. And in this case, we have stipulated that there is none. By contrast, I hold that God does nothing for what he does not deserve to be glorified. Now, I've got a question here, and I'm not sure whether I can phrase it properly, but uh, the, it's, he seems to agree with Descartes that God has created this perfect world, right? Yeah. Do you get this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you could I can't contrast that with with let's say the Monarchian idea hmm. that you know Satan is there too, and that there is that there is this conflict. It's not like you know God is a, is always in control of things that are going on here on Earth or elsewhere. It's just that uh, there is some satanic force that he's up against mm -hmm. and uh i uh i mean that's what 
you know, he, if, what I'm getting from this so far is that that uh, Leibniz is, is sort of accepting that that uh, all uh, knowing perfect God, you know, which doesn't account for a lot of things that go on on Earth. Um, well, part of, and I guess, hmm, how to best, and Jerry or, or Quan or Eureka, you guys can totally chime in if you feel any, any desire to throw a, a thought out there, eh? Um, yeah, well, I think that the notion of freedom can bring a part of the answer to that. Um, I would, I would, I would hypothesize that perfection would not be perfect if it does not allow from, uh, if it does not allow a dissident voice. Uh, I don't know if you guys understand what I mean by that. All right. So, so like if you would, you, you wouldn't see perfection unless there was imperfection. Yeah. Uh, yeah yes. Uh, it's another way to say that. And I would say that a perfect God that would not allow for a rebel, for a dissident voice, would not be perfect because in that case, he would be a tyrant in the sense that uh, he would make everything um, perfectly quiet and not dynamic, if you want. Hmm. Okay. And because freedom and then we is only possible. Someone that he made us as imperfect beings, right? Uh, I, would say, I would say he opened the door to freedom because freedom is po possible only if you can disobey. If you cannot disobey, there is no freedom. Mm. But what, what about, you know, the good and evil? The good and evil could reside within all of us, right? And it's, you know, it depends on what you cultivate. Yeah, exact, exact, and uh, and once and, again, I, uh, this I is see. probably what I I uh, I get more from you know re reading over your essay on uh, Confucius. This was very much uh, imbued in Confucian philosophy, and probably other uh, other Eastern uh, philosophers. And then you, you get the thing in the, you know, in the the Persian Zoroastrian thing where you have this constant fight between good and evil. And this seemed to be missing from uh, Christian, most Christian and even Islamic uh, law in the sense that uh, they, 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 they seem to be God is perfect, you know. Yeah, but, or, but or God has that. created a perfect world in some way. Although yeah. I, I, I've you know read things that were that's conflict. Why is there, you know, why did uh, in, in that case why does uh, evil exist? Obviously, yeah. Well, but but I insist. Uh, the world would not be perfect if there is no possibility to disobey. And uh, really? once again, uh, the, the devil, after all, was an uh, is an archangel. If you if you accept the Christian mythology, okay. so the guy who first disobey because of pride uh, showed that that creation was perfectly good and perfect because he had the possibility to disobey. Huh. Okay. Would you then, say then, yeah, that's Christian uh, war. It's just like there, there's so many aspects of it that uh, and I, what I look for I guess is the unifying factor, uh, the unifying factor that would take the essence of Christianity, the essence of Islam, the essence of Confucian philosophy, 
and anything else. And that to me is God, you know, in that sense. And, but that's a story, uh, that's not what Leibniz is talking about, of course. But then that doesn't mean it's not enlightening for his epic. But I think it has to be seen in his epic. It's this, uh, I'm, I'm, I never read Leibniz before. I read Immanuel Kant, I think it was a uh, critique of pure reason or something like that. As years ago, and it was interesting. It very seemed like very advanced for its time in approaching other philosophies. You know, you know, a more a global kind of uh, view. But uh, now I'm, I'm just all I'm seeing so far is that that Leibniz progressive for his time, and I think. Probably, you know, it, 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 science and, and obviously against uh, somebody like Isaac Newton, he's he's like far ab above him, you know. But I, I still sense that there's still that 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 you know he's locked into a, a, a certain concept of God. Well, let's see. I mean, we're scratching the surface right now, but Eureka, I, I know you, you had uh, a thought. I wanted to ask Juan, uh, when he said freedom, uh, Juan, did you mean free will or something different when you mentioned freedom? Yes, it's free will. Okay, because free will, because of freedom in the political sense, in my mind, is a very ordinary thing, okay, because political freedom can be defined uh, in different ways, okay? But free will is something much more fundamental. And uh, I, I think that free will is related intimately to creativity. So, uh, so once again, I'm sorry to repeat myself, uh, the creation would not be perfect if we created to the, uh, according to the image of God, uh, do not possess free will, meaning the, the possibility to disobey. So you're, you're basically saying that uh, we're given choice. Exactly. Because if we cannot disobey by our very nature, there's no freedom and there's no perfection. Because free will is very related to creativity. I'm just a little bit confused because um, when we speak of free will, um, some people would say that we don't actually have free will because we're bound by the laws of the uh, universe. So is free will the same as choice? That's kind of what I was wanted to ask you. Uh, I think that you understood perfectly the, the point. Exactly. Uh, yes, we are determined to a certain extent by the laws of the universe, but precisely these laws are perfect because we can't disobey, okay? Imagine a totalitarian universe where you cannot disobey, okay? So that would be a non-perfect universe. Because part, part of the, well, one thing I would ask the person who would say that there is no free will because it's all predetermined by the laws of the universe, you could ask him like, well, why did, why did you choose to have that opinion rather than another opinion? Cause you could have, you know, you could have chosen to have an opinion opposite to that, you know? Uh, so ultimately um, we could, we, you know, ultimately we have to freely choose which idea we, we judge to be best one according to certain standards. Um, and are those standards we're using, are they the best possible standards that we could have picked or did we pick something uh, less, less good than it could have been? that causes us to make foolish, uh, foolish decisions. And if you're somebody with influence who makes policy, those types of mistakes could result in a lot of pain. Oh, sounds like there's some robots attacking you. <laughs> um, there's another thought. Oh yeah, the other thought too, I think, is this idea of grace because one of the, the elements of perfection, because it always keep a sort of a flexible mind when you're thinking about the words Leibniz is, use, is using. 
So when he says perfection, is he what ideas are imbued in the definition of his idea of perfection versus uh, Descartes' idea of perfection or some other uh, definition of perfection? Because Leibniz focuses a lot on, on this interconnecting on grace as well. And then what is grace? As well as being both good and logical, it has to be also graceful. And if it loses one, it's not really perfect anymore. Uh, which I think I, I got that idea of like that tyrannical God that Quan was talking about that made a world of automatons who had no ability to, you know, a bunch of like human robots who had no ability to do anything but what their program <laughs> told them to do. <laughs> not very graceful. Like it's just <laughs> very cold Borg like calcul calculators. Yeah. And it's like, there's no point being of even like praising anybody for doing good at that point. You're like, well, of course you did good. You had to. It's like, who, who cares? <laughs> like, who cares? Yeah, exactly. What is, what is courage in that world? What is a virtue? It's nothing. Should I continue? You want. Okay. Uh, the love that we owe to God above all things is based, I think, on our grasp of the great truth that God always acts in the most perfect and desirable way possible. For a lover looks for satisfaction in the happiness or perfection of the loved one and of his actions. Friendship is wanting the same things and not wanting the same things. And I think it will be hard to love God properly without being disposed to want what he wants, even if one had the power to get something different. Indeed, those who are not satisfied with what God does are like malcontent subjects whose mindset is not much different from a rebel's. These principles lead me to maintain that loving God requires a certain attitude to everything that happens to us through his will, not just passively accepting it because one has no alternative but being truly satisfied with it. I am saying this about the past, for we shouldn't be quietists about the future, stupidly waiting with folding arms for what God will do as in the fallacy of the argument for idleness, as the ancients call it. So far as we can judge what God wants in a general way, we should act in accordance with that, doing our very best to contribute to the general good, and in particular, to adorning and perfecting the things that concern us, the things that are within reach, the outcome may show that in a particular instance, God didn't want our good will to have its effect. But it doesn't follow that he didn't want us to do what we did. On the contrary, as he is the best of masters, he never asks more than the right intention. And it is up to him to know when and where good intentions should succeed uh, yeah, may i comment on that <laughs> <laughs> you can do whatever you want <laughs> <laughs> to me this god so far that, that that he's talking about is uh you know you sort of uh you know ask in a way not to ask questions he's all good you know and I mean, maybe this is going to change at some point in time, but it's not like seeing God through goodwill or through, you know, the soul of uh, Matt Eric or Quan or, you know, <laughs> anybody there. You know, it's, it's not that there's he's saying also it seems to be so sort of very submissive so far well, to 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 an all-powerful god i almost don't want to say anything to that because i i am curious to see where he goes and i don't 
Yeah, I, I, uh, okay. Uh, but that being said, I mean, it might be. Too, because it, it, it may develop into something more. And uh, when I think of, you know, I get, I've read books, for instance, on the early Gnostics and the, the Gnostics, and their big heresy was that they were, uh, they were, they exalted kind of what was later the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and the internal uh, good in other people. And, uh, you know, that's more or less where I would see where, you know, the goodness of God in, in, uh, in other people. And, you know, instead of being preoccupied with whether you're going to go to the pearly gates or heaven, you know. Yeah, well, one thing you're, gonna, you're not going to get much out of Leibniz is the idea that we should do good because we want to go to heaven and be rewarded. Um, that, that you won't really get. But I think one of the problems that um, he, and, and I know a lot of people in my own life who have sort of suffered from this, is that you, when you have a naive hope uh, or you do things naively uh, for religious reasons, um, and you're, you're, you're disappointed, like things don't work out uh, the way that you had faith that they would, you, you can become uh, the opposite of what you were. So you were a, a religious blind fundy, and then all of a sudden you become sort of the opposite and become a total like disbeliever in anything and nihilist. And there's like history is littered with these examples of people who like were, you know, they had <laughs> religious conviction for, with, with flaky foundations and then they became their opposite. And yeah. uh, I think, you know, Leibniz is a guy, you got to keep this in mind as well, based on what we had read last week and the week before. He's a guy who's in the middle of uh, uh, international conspiracies, that he's, he's creating grand designs, he's creating initiatives, he's working with people. Many of the people that he's working with, some of them are, get poisoned. And he's always trying to create new situations that bring out the good, that allow for the creation of new opportunities. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities for disappointment. And he sees a lot of disappointment, you know, throughout his life. Mm -hmm. So he's, I think, always trying to think, like, what do people need to think about in order to have that firm foundation that you might live through tragedy, disappointment, think injustice, but still not lose your... Uh, your sublime foundation? Like, how do you keep that rock solid despite the fact that, you know? Well, you know, you, you have to look at him in, in terms of his time. I, I agree with you. And, you know, I believe somebody had mentioned that previously. Maybe I think Jerry did in uh, the sense that these people are, were political. You know, and that's what, we, that's what we're seeing now. That they, they're not just into metaphysics they're applying them to their life yeah and like one thing he gets at here is that you know we shouldn't ever have the argument for idleness with, and wait with folded arms to see what god will do he's like that that's that's a naive thing he's talking because he says i'm talking about the past here when we should be satisfied with what happens um yeah but in the sense that don't go into the future with that same attitude you know, we should do our very best, as he says, to contribute to the general good, despite the fact that you may not see it happen. You should still, doesn't mean that God didn't want you to try, you know, and maybe that wasn't the moment for it to, to pan out the way it was supposed to. But I think he's just trying to get you in that, that, that space to be able to be happy and effective, despite the failures that might befall you. Yeah. Yeah. I think he, uh, in that last part, he kind of gets at his idea of freedom or free will. Mm. That, that what did he say? He said um, we we judge what God wants, and we we act in accordance with that. As he said, doing our best to contribute to that. So, I think that's his concept of free will that you. You try to understand what God is trying to do, and you try to act towards that. It's uh, it's interesting. It's very similar to Milton, his idea. Oh. Never it's read like, Milton. Oh, well, 
in um, Paradise Lost, he he says free will is not deciding right from wrong. It's deciding whether or not you accept the grace of God. He, he's saying it's it's your intention of why you do something that defines your free will, not what you do, but the actual intention of it. And it's it's similar to that 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 sentence line that says. If you're trying to to discover what God is trying to do, then you decide to try to contribute towards that in whatever way you can, which is not going to be a perfect way, but in your uh, in your best way. It's mm-hmm. it's a similar concept to Milton. Cool. It's interesting. interesting. You know, it's not like a computer. A computer sees a one and a zero. Yeah. Right. That, but that's not freedom. The human mind doesn't work in terms of a one and a zero. It's not. It's the intention behind it, which is quite complicated. Hmm. Right. At least that's my view of it. I think it's it's probably a good a good a good thought. It's a good thought. So let let's do maybe um uh, like four sections each, unless the section gets really crazy long or something. Um, so who wants to pick up five to eight? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. I can start. Okay. Number five. So it is enough to be sure of this about God, that He does everything for the best and that nothing can harm those who love him. But to know in detail his reasons for ordering the universe as he has, allowing sin and granting his saving grace in one way rather than another is beyond the power of a finite mind, especially one that has not yet attained the delight of seeing God. Still, Some general remarks can be made about how God goes about governing things. Thus, we can liken someone who acts perfectly to an expert geometer who knows how to find the best construction for a problem, to a good architect who exploits the location and the budget for his building to the best advantage not allowing anything nasty or less beautiful than it could be to a good head of a household who manages his property so that no ground is left uncultivated or barren to a clever special effects technician in the theater who produces his effect by the least awkward means that can be found or to a learned author who gets the largest amount of space matter into the smallest space he can. Now, minds are the most perfect of all things, occupying the least space and thus providing the least hindrance to one another because they don't take up space at all and their perfections are virtues. That is why we should be sure that the happiness of minds is God's principal aim, which he carries out as far as the general harmony will permit. I'll say more about this later. The simplicity of God's ways relates to the means he adopts, while their variety, richness, or abundance relate to ends or effects. These should be in balance with one another as the money for putting up a building has to be balanced against its desired size and beauty. Admittedly, whatever God does cost him, oh, hang on. Admittedly, whatever God does costs him nothing, even less than it costs a philosopher or a scientist to invent theories out of which to build his imaginary world. For God can bring a real world into existence merely by decreeing it. 
but in the exercise of wisdom by God or a scientist, there is something analogous to the cost of a building, namely the number of independent decrees or theories that are involved. For God's creative activity to be economical is for it to involve very few separate decrees. For a scientific theory to be economical in its means is for it to have very few basic principles or axioms. Reason requires that multiplicity of hypotheses or principles be avoided, rather as the simplest system is always preferred in astronomy. Now, it's, it, this is a, a fun one because it, it, it has some parallels to Occam's razor. You know, William of Occam's stupid edict that the, uh, the simplest theory isn't always the right one. But it's not really that at all. <laughs> it's more like what Einstein said that, uh, uh, you know, a scientific thought should always be expressed as simply as possible, but never simpler. It doesn't mean that, that the right answer is the simplest answer. It's, it's, so it has similarities. You can see how it can be deceiving, but it's not the same thing. Because it's one of the guides too, right? Like if, if the universe is made elegant, then there wouldn't be unnecessarily, there wouldn't be superfluity in the fabric of the creation of the universe. You wouldn't see like epicycles or equants in a model. If you were looking at like a model of the planetary motion, Somebody would, with this view, would, would look at all of these equants and, and complicated, you know, epicycles upon epicycles and be like, well, that, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> There's got to be a better way to look at this. And if you didn't have that view, you would just keep on adding infinite amounts of epicycles to make it a little bit closer <laughs> to what your observations show you with no end. Yeah, it means there's something wrong with your hypotheses. Yeah. Or like string theory today, right? Like how many models <laughs> of... Uh, of string theory or of, di of dimensions, uh, do they prove right. like no end? Everything is equally true as long as it's you know they could just keep on adding elements to their their system to make up dark matter and black holes mm -hmm. and energy and oh, yeah. whatever just to keep on <laughs> holding on to your your overly complex model. Or how many uh, of these subatomic particles they have to invent too? They just keep coming up with new ones. Yeah, there's like 150 now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, should I go on? Anybody yeah. else want to have a thought or we, we go on? No, go on, Jay. Yep. Okay, number six. God's wishes or actions are usually divided into the ordinary and the extraordinary. But we should bear in mind that God does nothing that isn't orderly. When we take something to be out of the ordinary, we are thinking of some particular order that holds among created things. We do not, or ought not to, mean that the thing is absolutely extraordinary or disordered, in the sense of being outside every order because there is a universal order to which everything conforms. Indeed, not only does nothing absolutely irregular ever happen in the world, but we cannot even feign such a thing. Suppose that someone haphazardly draws points on a page, like people who practice the ridiculous art of fortune telling through geometrical figures. I say that it is possible to find a single, a single formula that generates a geometrical line passing through all those points in the order in which they were drawn. And if someone drew a continuous line, which was now straight, now circular, now of some other kind, it would be possible to find a notion or rule or equation that would generate. The contours of anyone's face 
could be traced by a single geometrical line governed by a formula. But when a rule is very complex, what fits it is seen as irregular. So one can say that no matter how God had created the world, it would have been regular and in some general order. But God chose the most perfect order, that is, the order that is at once simplest in general rules and richest in phenomena, as would be a geometrical line whose construction was easy, yet whose properties and effects are, were very admirable and very far-reaching. These comparisons help me to sketch some imperfect picture of divine wisdom and to say something that might raise our minds to some sort of conception, at least, of what cannot be adequately expressed. But I don't claim that they explain this great mystery of creation on which the whole universe depends. Okay, any thoughts on that one? Kind of reminds me of uh, Kuza and his uh, maximum minimum principle. Leibniz says God's order is the simplest in rules and richest in phenomenon. Kind of similar idea. Yeah, the minimum maximum um, yes. <clears throat> principle of yeah, nature. Yeah, and there, yeah, there's an idea of always oh, an, an economy, an economy of nature, like like all of these guys, whether it's Ferma. Or uh, or Huygens, who's they're both doing, you know, they're both making their breakthroughs in optics based on an understanding of the minimum maximum idea uh, in nature, the max amount of work with the least amount of effort, and it expressed itself in in all sorts of ways. Um, that really shapes Leibniz's thinking and its practical applications in terms of human society as well. So I was wondering, he says he could find, you know, an equation for any kind of these, we think, random dots on a paper. Mm -hmm. He could find that. But um, he says he can't explain the mystery of creation that way. I guess he's against the Big Bang, Big Bang Theory. Yeah, but he also, yeah. He, he is also trying to get across that just because you something seems to be um, supernatural, you know, and people also believe he's talking to two sets of people, right? Some people in his world, uh, they believe very deeply in everything in the Bible. Um, also, they, they, they encounter pe people encounter phenomenons in nature that maybe it's a comet or something else that that doesn't seem to be explained by known uh, known science. And he's like sort of talking to both of these elements of how do we deal with the unknown and for the case of people who believe in, you know, like miracles and, and such, do we say that these are outside of the ordered harmony of nature? There's like the ordered harmony of nature of all of the normal things. And then there's these super normal things that are just, you know, <laughs> outside. And he's like, no, just because you haven't discovered it, it doesn't mean it's not subject also to a higher rhythm and reason. Um, you just don't know it yet, but don't assume that it's absurd or irrational or just because God wills it, you know, just because or, or something like that. He's always trying to keep your mind in, in, a, in a different sort of headspace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay, we, are we ready to go on or any more comments? I don't know. Quan is it good? No. No, perfectly good. Perfectly good. <laughs> wow. Well, Matt, Matt, we we in the Latinesian universe tonight. <laughs> all right, it's the best of all possible readings. Okay. <laughs> Sufficiently perfect. Okay, number seven. Now, because nothing can happen that isn't orderly. Miracles can be said to be as orderly as natural events. 
The latter are called natural because they conform to certain subordinate rules, ones that are not as general and basic as God's fundamental creative decrees, which we call the nature of things. This nature is only a way in which God customarily goes about things, and he can give it up if he has a reason for doing so, a reason that is stronger than the one that moved him to make use of these subordinate maxims in the first place. General acts of the will are distinguished from particular, particular ones. Using one version of this distinction, we can say that God does everything according to his most general will, which conforms to the most perfect order that he has chosen, but that he also has particular wills, which are exceptions, not to the most general of God's laws, which regulate the whole order of the universe, and to which there are no exceptions, but to the subordinate maxims I have mentioned, the ones that constitute nature. Any object of God's particular will is something he can be said to want. But when it comes to the objects of his general will, such as our actions of created things, especially rational ones, which God chooses to allow, we cannot say that God wants them all and must make a distinction. One, if the action is intrinsically good, we can say that God wants it and sometimes commands it, even if it doesn't happen. Two, but an action may be intrinsically bad and only incidentally good because later events, especially ones involving punishment and reparations, correct its wickedness and make up for the bad with some despair, so that eventually there is more perfection overall than if this bad thing had not been done. In a case like that, we must say that God allows the action, but not that he wants it, even though he goes along with it because of the laws of nature that he has established and because he sees how to derive from it a greater good. Well, any comments on that? I was reminded of Kwan's uh, statement of, of the dissonances. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still digesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's dense. Yeah. yeah. It, this has to be read quite a few times and thought. I mean, each one of these these elements can be unpacked and and really built. Yeah. Discussed all day long. So we're just taking it all in, in a sense, and you know, don't don't want to over. Uh, overstress by not capturing every every element. It's designed to be weighty. Okay. All right. Number eight. It is quite hard to distinguish God's actions from those of created things. Some believe that God does everything, and others suppose that he only conserves the force he has given to created things, allowing them to decide in what directions the force shall be exercised. We shall see later on what truth there is in each of these. Now, since actions and passions properly belong to individual substances, when there is an action, there is some thing, some subject that acts, I have to explain what such a substance is. This much is certain. When several predicates are attributed to the same subject, and this subject is not attributed to any other, it is called an individual substance. For example, we call John a substance 
because we can attribute to him honesty, intelligence, and so on. But we don't call his honesty a substance because although we can attribute predicates to it, his honesty is charming and surprising, we can attribute it to something else, namely to John. In contrast, John cannot be attributed to anything else. But that explanation is only nominal. All it does is to relate our calling a thing a substance to other facts concerning what we say about it. Beyond that, we need to think about what it is for something to be truly attributed to a certain subject. For example, what it is for honesty to be a property of John. Now it is certain that all true pre predication is founded in the nature of things. And when a proposition is not identical, that is, when the predicate is not explicitly occluded in the subject, as in the man who governs Somalia, governs Somalia, it must be implicitly included in it. This is what philosophers call in essa, being in, when they say that the predicate is in the subject. So the notion of the subject term must always include that of the predicate so that anyone who understood the subject notion perfectly would also judge that the predicate belongs to it. We can therefore say that the nature of an individual substance or of a complete being is to have a notion so complete that it is sufficient to include and to allow the deduction of all the predicates of the subject to which that notion is attributed. An accident, on the other hand, is a being whose notion doesn't involve everything that can be attributed to the subject to which that notion is attributed. Yeah, I think by accident, he just means like a consequence of or, or an effect of something more primary, right? Yeah. Okay. Thus, Alexander the Great's kinghood is an abstraction from the subject, leaving out much detail, and so is not determinate enough to pick out an individual and doesn't involve the other qualities of Alexander or everything that the notion of that prince includes. Whereas God, who sees the individual notion or thisness of Alexander sees in it at the same time the basis and the reason for all the predicates that can truly be said to belong to him, such as, for example, that he would con conquer Darius and Taurus, even to the extent of knowing a priori and not by experience, whether he died a natural death or by poison which we can know only from history. Furthermore, if we bear in mind the interconnectedness of things, we can say that Alexander's soul contains for all time traces of everything that did and signs of everything that will happen to him, and even marks of everything that happens in the universe although it is only God who can recognize them all. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, someone else want to continue? Yeah. And yeah, keep in mind, you know, for people listening as well, this is, he's sort of laying out as well basic, like, principles of reasoning like and also he's always thinking how does how do you 
how does he inoculate people from the the dangers of of Aristotelian syllogisms and sophistry, which is a technique that's been used for a very long time by the empire to get to make to give lies the appearance of truth, you know, using certain because a syllogism basically uses a predicate and a universal, some general statement and an, uh, a predicate, like a, a, a specific example of something. So you can say like, you know, uh, all like you have an idea of, of, I don't know, all birds fly thus, because this is a bird, it must fly. But it's like, no, that's a penguin. You know, it's not, it doesn't really, it's not true in that case but you could make that sort of a syllogism example. Um, and he's trying to get across that these, these predicates, these contingent accidents, and the, the, the deeper general ideas, the isnesses, the things that have intrinsic existence, like identities, or might, you might think monad. Um, that's what he also can call these monads. Um, they have a relationship to one another. And if you if you think it through, you can't fall for sophistry if you if you really really work it through. If you don't, you'll always be played. I guess I I'm here to defend Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Only to the extent that you know, without going through the syllogism, say oh they they uh, and. Uh, granted, there, there's certain mathematical about them, or uh, not mathematical, but you know, uh, just uh, mechanical. Uh, the he listed his list of fallacies still apply today. That that that's amazing. Like when you when you consider, I can read a newspaper and see. That somebody is uh, uh, poisoning the well, or uh, you know, cre- uh, jumping on the bandwagon. There are all these terms mm. that that he identified. Can you give that- me an example of of a couple of of the fallacy uh, the rules of fallacy, or I mean, principles of fallacies that Aristotle talks about? The, yeah, it, they, he, the, the, those were. A list of it, if it's been expanded upon since then, mm-hmm. but they're very useful. Unfortunately, journalists don't follow them, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, today, but to that extent, so when you talk about sophistry, I, you know, I, you know, I'm sure Aristotle could defend himself. <laughs> His term to use legalistically today. But the, the, the point is that there's much more to him than I can understand when you're making this juxtaposition with Plato and uh, Aristotle, okay. that, uh, that uh, they were both involved in the politics of their time. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Aristotle could have been a son of a bitch, as far as I know. You know, I, I don't know, you know. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't take away from what he's done. Yeah, no, and don't get me wrong. Syllogisms have a place and they're useful. No, I, no, I don't, I don't want to try to as the as the sophist, uh, you know the the uh, the typical sophist or anything like that. There are probably better examples, but I understand how you're coming out out of that because there was a political background to there, and it it, it serves the purpose of you know, the, the narrative. Uh, let, let me, let me just try to, cause I, I like Leibniz certainly would not try to say that one should not know their, their rules of, of logic. And you, you really should. Um, it's just that if you don't know more than that, you can easily fall prey to their misuse um, to seduce you into a, a false path of thinking. Um, but so, yeah. You you got to know uh, them in order to also know what what they're what they're lacking. Yeah, uh, Matthew, if I, if I may. Yeah. Man. Uh, w- we go back once again at the center of our discussion every time in our group. It's not that it would bring us to a false path, but to a 
lower path that we would not go higher. And that's the, that's the intention of Leibniz to remind us that we can go higher in terms of reasoning and to the infinite journey of the mind, if you want. I accept that. Well, wait a minute. Couldn't you say that it could be a false path, though? Like if, if, if we're uh, being set up to go into a lower path that keeps us locked into a false uh, low level of, of mo mental motion, prevented from going higher, uh, isn't that also known as the false path if we could have taken a bit the higher path? Or am I wrong? Yes, because, but because you have an aristocratic mind, Matthew. Because oh. for you, <laughs> if, if, uh, uh, yes, because for an aristocratic mind, if it's low, it means false, because the truth or the reality is to go always go higher. But what if it makes you worse? What if you're actually becoming not just lower than you could be, but you're actually becoming worse because of? A choice you've made in your thinking. Uh, I would say I would answer like an oligarch. Okay, for the <laughs> oligarchs, they are always interested to have a class of technocrats capable of Aristotelian thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so those technocrats would be useful to them. So they would maintain them at the level of the syllogistic reasoning. They would not uh, wish for them to be lower than that because they would not be no more useful. That's so, okay. so what I think I, I'm getting at what you're saying, Juan, is higher doesn't depend on your ability to uh, express yourself in, in, in logic. It's your motivation, basically, your, your, whether there's a purity of heart or soul or or your ideas, what they're based on. Uh, anybody can uh, try any sort of win an argument, but if it's an ego trip, if it's based on an ego trip, then it's it's uh, it's meaningless in a way. You don't, you don't win. You, one can win, but there's nothing to get. Exactly. And exactly, and that's what I meant by an aristocratic mind. An aristocratic mind is a mind that is attracted to the feeling of agape, okay? That feeling of uh, uh, deep joy with uh, discovery and creativity. And in that sense, when you are more looking for that agape feeling, uh, they are things that open by themselves that would not open if you were motivated by lower feelings. Yeah. Hmm. So, you know, motivation has a lot to do with it, right? Even if you're on the wrong track sometimes. Yeah. Never heard it put that way. That was good. Yorika, any thoughts or do we, do we move on? What do we do? We can move on. Okay. Yorika, do you want to read? Nine, several considerable paradoxes to follow from this. Among others, that is, never, true that two substances are entirely alike, differing only in being two rather than one. It also follows that a substance cannot begin except by creation, nor come to an end except by annihilation. And because one substance can't be destroyed by being split up or brought into existence by the assembling of parts, in the natural course of events, the number of substance remains the same, although substances are often transformed. Moreover, each substance is like a whole world and like a mirror of God, or indeed of the whole universe, which each substance expresses in its own fashion, rather as the same town looks different according to the position from which it is viewed. 
in a way, then, the universe is multiplied as many times as there are substances. And in the same way, the glory of God is magnified by so many quite different representations of his work. It can even be said that each substance carries within it, in a certain way, the imprint of God's infinite wisdom and omnipotence and imitates him as far as it can. For it expresses, though confusedly, everything that happened in the universe, past, present, and future. And this is a little like infinite perception or knowledge. And as all the other substances express this one in their turn and adapt themselves to it, that is, they are as they are because it is as it is. It can be said to have power over all the others, imitating the creator's omnipotence. Continue. If thou wilt. The ancients, as well as many able teachers of theology and philosophy, a few centuries ago, men accustomed to deep thought and admirable in their holiness, seem to have had some knowledge of the things that I have been saying, and to have been led by that to introduce and defend substantial forms. These are much sneered at, but they are not so far from the truth, nor so ridiculous as the common run of our new philosophers suppose. I agree that these forms have no work to do in explaining particular events, and thus no role in the details of physics. That is where our scholastics this is actually, I think, a fine thing where the translator jumps in and says, uh, medieval Christian philosophers influenced by Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas being the most famous example. Scholastics went wrong, and the physicists of the past followed them into error. They thought they could invoke forms and qualities to explain the properties of bodies without bothering to find out how the bodies work. Like settling for saying that a clock's form gives it a time indicative quality without considering that consists what it can that what that consists in, that is without considering what mechanisms are involved. Actually, that might be all the clock's owner needs to know. If he leaves the care of it to someone else, but this misuse and consequent failure of forms shouldn't make us reject them. Metaphysics needs a knowledge of them so much that without that knowledge, I maintain, we couldn't properly grasp the first principles of metaphysics and could it raise our minds to the knowledge of immaterial natures and the wonders of God. However, important truths need to not be taken into account everywhere. A ge geometer need not worry about the famous la labyrinth uh, of the labyrinth. labyrinth of the composition of the continuum. And then the translator writes in, I, I, this might be important, that is the puzzles that arise from the idea that a line has no smallest parts. And the huge difficulties to be found in trying to reconcile free will with God's providence need not trouble a moral philosopher, still less a lawyer or politician, or the geometer can do all his proofs and the politician can complete his plan without getting into those debates necessary and important 
So they are in philosophy and theology. In the same way, a physicist can explain his experiments, sometimes using simpler experiments he has already made, sometimes proofs in geometry and mechanics without needing to bring in general considerations belonging to another sphere. And if he does go outside his sphere and appeal to God's cooperation or to some soul or spiritual force or other thing of that kind, he is talking nonsense just as much as someone who drags large scale reflections about the nature of destiny and our freedom into an important practical deliberation. Indeed, men often enough unthinkable, unthinkably make this mistake when they let the idea of what is fated to happen tangle their thoughts and sometimes are even deterred by that idea from some good decision or some important precaution. You guys had a general gist of, of what he was what he was getting at there, number ten. My circuits are overloaded. Yeah, that'll happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, the, the um, yeah, I think we'll we'll probably do another four. Like Quan will read four more, and then we'll we'll uh, phase it out for tonight. But. Keep in mind that the thing I was saying in the introductor in my introduction, that, and you get this as sort of a theme throughout a lot of his writings over the years, is he's always trying to get people to figure out how they find the balance between the rigorous uh, mechanical reasoning that they that he knows people need to do to, to develop if you're going to be a real scientist that makes discoveries and not just a philosopher who's constantly navel gazing, you know. Or arguing like the scholastics, how many you know the famous the famous jab that you know they're always arguing uh, how many how many uh, angels can fit on the pinhead of a needle, and writing diet you know giant thing. And so you don't want to you don't want to miss that part of your your mental muscles, but you don't want to have those mental muscles at the expense of losing your sense of final causes or or, or you know the final truths of uh, of God justice those higher principles that have to coexist. So it's always, you know, when you're, when you're coming down to why is something true, you don't want to say, Oh, because the formula says it's true. That's not satisfying, but you need to, to know your formulas and you don't want to just say, Oh, because God made it. And that's why it's true. That's not satisfying either. <laughs> so it's, yeah, you know, he's always working at, at balancing those out for good metaphysics. I would say that it's like playing an instrument, okay? You need to know your scales. You need to know where to touch the strings or the keys and so on. That would be the level of Aristotle, okay? So Aristotle is not entirely false, but you would not be a true musician if you cannot go beyond that level. And it's the same thing for life and for understanding nature and human mind and the general realities and principles of the universe. Do we go on for number number 11? Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I didn't realize this until now. Just quick thought. When he said that a geometer need not worry about the famous labyrinth of the con of the continuum. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that does he mean, do you guys think um, Zeno's paradox? Like that problem that, that a line can't be reducible to parts because you could always like infinitely divide a line in such a way that it could exclude the possibility of you moving from point a to point b if you're always like moving over half of the space always it, it's is that what he's talking about but absolutely and okay. once again let's not forget it's a paper from leibniz and that oh, problem wow. has been solved precisely by the creation by plato of his epistemology good show cool I know. Yep. Uh, are we continuing? Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, go, go on. 
I know I am putting forward a considerable paradox in claiming to rehabilitate the ancient philosophy in a way and to readmit substantial forms when they have been all but vanished. But perhaps you won't just brush me off if you realize that I have thought a, a lot about the modern philosophy, that I have spent much time on experiments in physics and proofs in geometry, and that for a long time, I was sure that these entities, substantial forms, are futile. Eventually, I had to take them up again, against my will, as though by force, after my own researches made me recognize that thinkers these days do less than justice to St. Thomas and to other great men of this time, and that the views of scholastic philosophers and theologians contain much more good stuff than people suppose, provided they are used relevantly. I am convinced indeed that if some exact and thoughtful mind took the trouble to clarify and digest their thought in the way the anal analytic geometers do, he would find them to be a treasure house of important and completely demonstrable truths. Picking up again the thread of our reflection, I believe that anyone who thinks about the nature of substance, as I have explained it above, will find that there is more to the nature of body than extension that is size, shape, and motion, and that we can't avoid attributing to body something comparable with a soul, something commonly called substantial form, though it has no effect on particular events any more than do the souls of animals if they have souls. It can be proved indeed that the notion of size shape movement is less sharp and clearer than we imagine. And that it includes an element that belongs to imagination and the senses as due to a much greater degree, color, heat and other such qualities, which we can doubt are really there in the nature of external things. That is why qualities of such kinds could never constitute the basic nature of any substance. Moreover, if there is nothing but size, shape, movement to make a body the thing that it is, then a body can never persist for more than a moment because bodies constantly gain and lose tiny bits of matter. However, the soul and the substantial form of body other than ours, are quite different from our thinking souls. Only the latter know their own actions, and they don't naturally go out of existence, but last forever and always retain the foundation of the knowledge of what they are. That is what makes them alone liable to punishment and reward, and what makes them citizens of the Republic of the Universe, which of which God is the monarch. It also follows that all other creatures must serve them. I shall say more about that later. This is a little second. I'm going to reread this later on, but it, it it's a direct response to a lot of the quotes. Remember in the last uh, few readings of the Leibniz versus Venice papers, when there was quotes by Sarpy and by uh, Newton on the principles of reasoning that, and also on Locke that all said that said that the nature of substance is what like the fundamental nature of substance says Sarpy. You guys remember? He says it's extension. <laughs> Extension. Yeah, exactly. It's bodies extended in space, and that's that substance. That's all. That's the fundamental quality. Sorry, what was that, Bob? No, I was saying, what, what was it? I didn't get it. 
Oh, I, I was asking if people rem- and and Jerry got it, but uh, if people oh. remembered what what Sarpy um, and his followers like Isaac Newton were saying the fundamental essence of or the nature of substance was and what they were saying it was is extension in space that bodies that substance is bodies and bodies are extended in space that can be like measured with our sense impressions and that's that's fundamental and then Leibniz is directly speaking to to that false definition by saying no no that, that's actually not that important there's something more fundamental but I didn't hear what Jerry said. Oh, Jerry? Jerry? No, I didn't say anything. He did it. <laughs> he did uh, extension. He said that. Yeah, oh, what was the yeah I was. Yeah. Uh, okay. Whatever. Okay, I thought you did say, say something, but anyway. I think it's getting late. <laughs> okay. okay, so that was that was number twelve. So, are we good for uh, for four more, or do we want to end it here? I, I'm I'm okay with either one. I know Bob's Bob's feeling it. Bob's conking out here. Yeah. yeah but- <laughs> All right, we can we can stop here. I, I mean, it's fine. You guys were great. I I have to. Uh, Leibniz is a little tough to handle, you know. Yeah. He's, he's uh, yeah. to me in in metaphors here. I've got to digest them, and uh, you know, uh, I uh, I appreciate all the comments though uh, that enlightened me. I believe, and uh, I look forward to next week. Yeah, me too. No, it, it's good. I mean, that was, that's a really good mental muscle. Like that. That's like the gyms are closed here in Montreal. I, we haven't been to the gym in a long time, so this is. Uh, the, thing. All right. <laughs> the gym? Or is that on the rocks? Oh, the gym. <laughs> no, the gym. The gym is accessible. <laughs> I didn't know where you were at, then, guys. Okay. I'll take care. Huh? All right. See you, Bob. Okay. Yeah, so uh, for the rest of us, yeah, I guess uh, we're good then for tonight. Cool. I think so. All Just, right. I want to say one thing. That yeah. that last part when Leibniz is talking about forms, that's starting to remind me of Plato, you know, when he uses the idea, the ideas, the form, mm-hmm. same thing. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's exactly that. Yeah. And he's gonna he's gonna become more explicit even on it. But yeah, he's this idea of isness like this. That's what Plato's always getting at, right? Like, what's the intrinsic isness of something? Um, that's mm-hmm. that's more than just the definition or the sense impressions of whatever. Right, the essence. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. I think that it was Whitehead who wrote that poem. Western civilizations are footnotes to Plato's dialogues. Hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah Whitehead's, he's a sophisticated guy. I gotta I gotta really read more of him. I'm pretty sure he's very high level. I I, I don't think he's an honest player. He he's just so enmeshed with Bertrand Russell. He's a Cambridge apostle, and usually you don't become a Cambridge apostle working with Bertrand Russell. <laughs> Uh, unless there's something, something shady, but I can't, I can't tell. It's not so obvious. He's... Well, you know, I, I think that uh, once again, I, I'm a little bit a, uh, a Caspier, as they say in French, by reminding always that, but uh, in the uh, allegory of the cave, uh, let's not forget that even the most brilliant minds will have to get a last ordeal or last test on the platform, if they decide to go to liberate their companions, hmm. or they decide to go on the platforms with the oligarchs. 
because uh, Bertrand Russell was uh, an excellent example because he was born in 1872. Let's not forget that, okay? So he was 20 years old in 1892. And he, I'm sure he was capable to read Plato in the original Greek. So he was not, he was not ignorant. I'm sure he knew more Plato than us. But he decided to go on the platform to play with the oligarchs. Yeah. What about Whitehead, though? Uh, more or less the same, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, I, you, uh, you probably know the, the, the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. Okay? Yeah. Well, I would say that for all people having a little bit brain, there's always that last temptation to go on the platform to play with the oligarchs. And most of us would fall in that trap. You know, Bertrand Russell, what he said in the scientific outlook for people who... Uh... What the hell is going on? Eureka, where are you? Are you outside? I guess you are. Okay. Uh... <laughs> um, yeah, what uh, Bertrand Russell said for the problem of the talented, uh, uh, the talent that should be born into the lower slave castes, but who shows all the aptitudes of the, the higher uh, master class is for, you know, to test them out. It's a difficult problem for the elites, but they're like, you know, you got to test them out if they pass the tests and they're willing to let go of their affiliations to their previous class, then you should be, uh, welcome them in to the master fold and let them become, I guess, you know, as we're talking uh, puppeteers. And if they're not, mm. off to the killing chamber. Wow. It's a tough decision, he says, but it has to be made. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure, I'm sure. It must torture them all night. <laughs> no. Yes. Yeah, he's a funny guy. He's got a bit of like a sick sense of humor. Yeah. Wow. Are you speaking of Whitehead or of, uh, Bertrand Russell? No, nah, Bertrand Russell. I don't know about how funny Whitehead was. Mm. And uh, But anyway, to, to come back to what he said, it's true that all Western civilization is formed by footnotes to the dialogues by Plato. Because uh, that guy wrote everything that is possible in terms of general principles. Of course, he was wrong for what I call details, okay? But uh, mm, yeah. uh, he, believed in the, uh, he believed in the element, earth, water, fire, and things like that. But uh, it's laughable nowadays, but it's not important. But for the basic principles, he laid down everything. Yeah, I know, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's not it's not so important what you think about particulars, but how you think about everything that matters. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you don't, if you don't have the tech at the time to to be right on certain details, it's not it's not so it's not so serious. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hey, Quan. Now that we're talking about this, I was reading a book um, on Confucius. It's a really old book, falling apart now, and the author was talking about. Um, how the later Neoplatonists, after long after, uh, sorry, the the later, I New Confucianists. I, I hope I said Confucius. Yeah, the the later Neo-Confucianists, long after Confucius died, the author maintains had corrupted the works and, and 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 tried to even like erase or get rid of certain things that Confucius probably developed upon, which would have given them a hard time about the method of reasoning. And do you know anything about like evidence of works that have been consciously erased or lost by Confucius over the ages that indicate that certain teachings that he had said he was going to develop upon or chapters of his works on the art of thinking or methods of thinking were, were erased? Oh, something you've heard of? I wouldn't give... I would give you a very disappointing but a definite answer, okay? okay. Because when the emp when the Chinese Empire decide in 136 uh, BCE to act to to to, to adopt 
Confucianism as the official doctrine uh, for ruling the empire, uh, they took the uh, corpus of Confucian uh, teaching and they made what I would call an orthodox version. And that orthodox version, of course, is a clean one, okay? So everything that pertains to the fact that the universe would not be perfect if there is not the possibility to descend or to disobey that kind of thing have been removed, of course. Mm. Okay, and I would like to remind you that Confucius died in 479 BCE. So the distance between 479 BCE and 136 BCE is about 350 years, okay? Three, let's say, uh, 13, 14 generations. Yeah. So uh, there is a Confucianism that is uh, going through the tunnel of Taoism, disguising itself as Taoism. Because I know that you don't believe too much in a serious Taoism, but there is a serious ta Taoism, which is the account of Confucianism going into hiding hmm. since there's an orthodox version of Confucianism hmm. adopted by the imperial ruling elite in China since 136 BCE and 136 BCE to the collapse of the Chinese empire is 21 centuries. Don't forget that. It's a very long time. So you're saying that there's elements in the occult or the, the there's elements of more pure Confucianism pre-edits or uh, censoring located Absolutely. in the things that are the in elements of, of Taoism is what you're saying? Look, the the Taoist corpus, which is called Dao Zhang in Chinese, meaning the the uh, the basket of Taoist doctrine, okay, mm -hmm. has not been translated in English at all, or just excerpts. Mm -hmm. And even in the, the the Asian world, okay, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Korean, uh, etc., uh, those are not studied very seriously. Okay, I'm sure that if that corpus is seriously edited, translated. Uh, study with uh, philological experts to have the exact meaning of each word because some of those words date for 500 years 600 years a thousand years 15 centuries etc i'm sure that we will discover plenty of rich things yeah that's interesting because i know something similar sort of happened in the case of the pythagoreans in the west where the Pythagoreans were all wiped out. We know that they were all killed twice. There were like two mass slaughters, right, where they were burnt alive. And they didn't really write much down. And what they did write down was lost to time. And so we have the Timaeus as probably the best exposition of, of it in, in a form that was still written after a lot of them were dead. I think all most of them were, were mostly wiped out. But then we have also it in the form of Aristotle, who... Uh, who becomes sort of the authority on the Pythagoreans and gives him sort of a bit of a, an ignorant name too. Cause he's like, he, you could tell Plato loves the Pythagoreans and Aristotle hates their method, but Aristotle becomes their, 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 in, you know, we see them through his eyes and his interpretation. Um, but you still have like elements of Gnostic, like Gnostic Neoplatonics who um, carry on Pythagorean uh, work, but a lot of it becomes sort of difficult because it's enmeshed with garbage um, and mystical exactly. numerology and things that are devoid of reason. But you know that there's also elements that are real there too, and it's tough to pick yes. them apart. Exactly. Uh, as Parmenides is, is not very well understood, okay? All the pre-Socratics uh, are not very well understood, okay? Mm -hmm. Because uh, what they were called the, the, the great uh, Greece in Southern Italy and Sicily at the time, for example, Parmenides, who was living in Southern Italy in a place called Pestum, for example, okay? Mm -hmm. They had 
what we would call mystical experiences, but those mystical experiences were not Bandodash or Hawkwash. Those were existential uh, experimentations in order for them to, to live to the full uh, their mind, okay? Mm. When Plato talked about, uh, 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 okay, we always talk about acacia, for example, or logics, okay? But, or dianoa, which is the mathematical uh, dialectics. But when Plato would speak epistemologically or from an education standpoint about dialectics or theoria, okay? Theoria is a Greek word meaning contemplation, okay? So uh, on a lower level, when we want to go above acacia, we can talk about text, we can discuss text, we can discuss... Uh, uh, geometry, we can discuss uh, mathematical formula, what part Plato called Dianoa. But once the guy was capable to go beyond Dianoa, Di Dianoa he would need to enter in dialectics and in theor theoria. Okay? And those kind of things has been explained by uh, Parmenides. And what, uh, because the Western University is centered on Athens, okay? And uh, the, 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 the heirloom that we got from Athens is a very intellectual heirloom, okay? Uh, you don't have the experiential experiments that those guys were living in order to open the space of their mind uh, when you got into the level of dialectics two and to theoria, okay? That would most of the time be confused with uh, mystical uh, bandadash, but uh, those were very living experiential uh, experimentations or, or methods or pedagogy or education uh, techniques uh, to open their minds. Okay, so uh, they, are, they are whole uh, uh, spans of the antique experience, either Chinese or Greek or Roman, that we don't have because we misunderstood them as a mystical hogwash or as a poetry, but in bad sense of poetry. Can you give me, um, I don't know if you, can you give me like a, a couple of examples of the sorts of things we would have been disregarding as mystical hogwash that we should be revisiting or paying a bit more respect to, just so I have Okay, I, I would go with a big thing, okay? I would go with a big, big thing. Okay. The famous book of the dead of the Egyptian, for example. Okay. Okay? It's most, uh, most of the Egyptologists would see it as a kind of religious uh, mythology, which is in part, of course. And they would be very afraid to go into the substance of the book of the dead of the Egyptians, okay? Beyond the beautiful imagery beyond the, the story and so on. But according to my understanding, that book of the dead of the Egyptian is very close to what the Parmenides school yeah. proposed in Southern Italy to open the mind, okay, uh, to the upper part, okay, to dialectics and to theory. Because uh, if you go to go, you want to go beyond uh, uh, acastia shadows, the sense perceptions, uh, reading, discussing texts, uh, uh, practicing geometry, uh, understanding mathematics, those are plan, those are sufficient. Okay, but when you are at Dianoa, at the level of Dianoa, how would you go beyond that? How would you go to precisely? the aristocratic realm and the realm of the king philosopher, okay? That you would need those experiential experience that would be uh, dismissed as mystical in the bad sense of the word mystical. Uh, and uh, uh, that precisely would reconcile uh, lower, the lower part of the curses Okay, of uh, the education system to a higher part. Okay, um, I'm sure, for example, that in the Middle Ages that we tend to, to see as uh, retarded compared to us 
uh, I'm not sure that they were so retarded, okay? Because uh, I have the intuition that uh, the quadrivium, the trivium, okay, would bring the student to the level of Dianoia. But uh, what we would see now as religious or mystical were precisely the educational courses that would bring the student uh, at the level of Dianoia to uh, dialectics and to theoria or contemplation. Hmm. And uh, probably, oh. I, I don't want I, I don't want to be uh, to, to to make an easy critique, but nowadays the education system is not even capable to bring people to the Dianoa system. So let's not fantasize too much about dialectics and theoria. Yeah, right. Yeah, got a ways to go. Do you have a um um? An example, and I, I guess I should just have a more serious look at the Book of, De of the Dead, but do you have like an example of one or two sorts of uh, experiences that, it, that the reader is, is brought into um, that have that value? I, I just don't yes. know. Uh. Okay, for example, in Southern Italy, uh, uh, at Parmenides' hometown of Velia, V-E-L-I-A, uh, they had experience when they would bring the mostes, the initiate, okay? Like in mysteries, for example. Mystery comes from Greek mostes, yeah. meaning the initiate. And they would uh, bury them in a cave underground, for example, after exercises of meditations and so on. Okay. And being buried underground for one, two, three days, would bring them in a psychological and intellectual experience that would open their mind to certain dimensions of the universe. When we say that the mind is precisely a perfect metaphor of the universe, because both are infinite, that kind of uh, meditation and experience, existential experience of being buried into the ground for two, three days in caves with supervisors, of course, would bring them precisely to that kind of uh, 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 not only mystical, but I would prefer to say a total experience to experience precisely the upper part of the mind. Isn't that the sort and of thing again, that they strive for with sensory deprivation chambers and stuff? To a certain extent. But uh, if you are doing that with the deprivation, uh, let's not forget that what they were doing in the past in high antiquity is at the end stage of a long educational courses okay. when the guy has been uh, initiated into uh, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, okay. Okay. medicine. Uh, it's not some random guy that would experience the uh, the privation chamber. You, yeah, you understand like what signed, I mean? Signed up to get twenty bucks to do LSD and get find himself for eighty days in a sensory deprivation chamber, getting poked and, and electro electrocuted by uh, Timothy Leary. <laughs> you know, it's not the same than doing that at <laughs> the end stage of what was uh, available at the time as uh, wow. science and philosophy and literature. Yeah, okay, sure, Chang. Sure, Chang. Okay. And uh, once again, uh, and uh, I hope I won't be perceived as a snob person saying that, but education in high antiquity was not compulsory, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you're not forced to go to school. The people going to school for a long time, it's because they like it, okay? Uh, they want to go to school. Okay, and when I said uh, half an hour ago that the oligarchs, they are they are interested to be at the top of a profit system, okay, so they want people to be capable to do some technical stuff. Yeah, uh, they they don't want people to be completely chaotic and de disorganized. They don't want that. Yeah, yeah. But they want people to be capable to be technical man, but they're not interested for people to be philosopher. Or uh, creators, okay. So, uh, so that's that's why I'm a little bit stubborn when I always say that Aristotle is not false; he's only limited. He's yeah. he's very useful for yeah. the oligarchical 
purpose to have a profit system. Because in a profit system, you need people who are capable to function. Yeah. Well, I just find so funny and contradictory. I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped a meal, so I'm just eating these seeds. Um, what I just find so contradictory is that they, they, while they hate the actual cause of creative change, they will always use the fruits of it, right? So they, they like using electricity, although they hate Ben Franklin and the way he thought that allowed for electricity to become discovered and utilized. So it's this total walking self-contradiction of a system. Well, as you said, they will let some creative geniuses to produce their things. They will take the products, they will control it. And uh, as long as they control it, it's okay. Well, I don't know if they even let the creative geniuses, they, they... They would rather kill the creative geniuses before they come up with creative new thoughts. They're just, they just always oh, they, seem to like they will, always, they will always be, have people that will create things, okay? Uh, unless that, uh, and uh, they will manage to take it. And uh, look, uh, each, di each royal dynasty or each imperial dynasty will always have a kind of art of literature that would be linked to that, the name of that dynasty. State, okay, uh, so they don't mind as long as they can appropriate those things. What I found also interesting, I was, I was watching a documentary on um, on uh, oh, it was on aesthetics. Why is beauty beautiful? Decent little documentary, and um, Roger Scruton, right? It was by Roger Scruton, who was the host. But one one point that was sort of interesting is is that he was talking to the Queen Queen Elizabeth's personal uh, sculptor, the official royal sculptor, and um, you know the guy doesn't like modern art and he doesn't like the destruction of the aesthetics of symmetry and beauty that that occurred in the twentieth century in in architecture and other things, and uh, like the 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 Windsor family and all of the the inner oligarchs they don't themselves tend to generally like the deconstructionist crap that was promoted by their their empire because it was it was promoted in order to create a, a sociopathic aristotelian elite that would live in a forever world of of a paulo dionysian you know like personal hedonism in your personal life but perfect order as a technocrat when you go out into your 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 public space and the the idea of the deconstruct like modern art was useful to to break beauty from truth as part of the the cultivation of that elite class and the masses were never expected to enjoy it like jackson pollock that was always supposed to be just for the elite they knew that the masses were never going to find that popular um but they themselves won't they don't like it <laughs> i just found that that was a funny thing yeah but precisely they, they want they want to create a snob thing okay yeah they, they want to make it people believe uh, in French they say that uh, uh, la moderne c'est une manière de vider la bourse du bourgeois okay de vider la, la poche du bourgeois okay uh, so it's a way to get the money from the idiot new bourgeois uh, and uh, it's a, a way also to create a kind of snob snobbish atmosphere uh that if you don't understand the new art it's because you're too dumb okay yeah. uh and and it's 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 uh, it's once again an oligarchical trick to because uh, you always succeed in an oligarchical trick if you uh, you touch to the vanity of people it's normal it's human mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's different levels of snobbery, different classes. <laughs> Hierarchy yeah. of snobbery. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah, because you got exactly. the, the queen and, and her inner sanctum being snobs against the uh, the snobs who love modern art, <laughs> who are snobs against the people who love uh, Lady Gaga. <laughs> but but Matthew, but Matthew, we, 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 we are laughing, but that's perfectly that's the perfect tool of oligarchy. Okay, to, to create different groups that we snob each other and uh, but uh, with the with those with the supreme people in terms of political power uh, in what kind of palace do they live they live in palaces 
view according to classical rules. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the definite answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Interesting phenomenon, eh? School would be so much more interesting if we were able to approach it with this appreciation. God. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, but but I think that with the education, uh, people are not so stupid. Okay, and I I, th I would say that. Uh, I don't know. Pretty stupid. Wow. Uh, uh, there will always be a significant minority that would not be hypnotized. And uh, because, uh, as I said, in, in high antiquity, at the time of Plato or Aristotle or even Cicero, uh, going to school was not a compulsory thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so the minority that would go to school, even from poor family background, it's because they like it, really. They really like it. Okay, they, they were born to go to school and to read and to discuss intellectual things and philosophical things and etc. Mm -hmm. And that minority still exists nowadays. Right. That's 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 exactly it. Well that's that's what we need to, to make even more popular, yeah, is, is just the, the pursuit of truth and hopefully in a in a world of lies where the soul yearns for truth. That's like it's food and hope. Um, hopefully as we get submerged by more problems that more people are going to have that thirst awoken inside their souls to want to seek out this type of process, right? Of just higher, yeah, exactly. higher learning on their own. Cause you're not going to get it from what's given to us and spoon fed to us from the institutions. You gotta, you gotta seek it out. Exactly, exactly, and uh, exactly. Uh, why did you think they suppressed the the classes of philosophy and of history? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, got a lot to think about. This is good. This is good soul food, guys. I always appreciate these Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. See you next Wednesday. Ciao. Oh, see Wednesday. you. On, so, see you on Sunday. <laughs> Bye, guys. Yes, Sunday. Bye. Ciao.